Welcome to the Play Inspire Unite podcast. I'm your host, Ben Rycroft. If you're not already, subscribe to Ontario Soccer on YouTube. Click that notification bell. That way, whenever we have a new interview, you're not going to miss anything. All of these new interviews and content we have coming out, we want you to be on top of that. This interview series is about lifting the curtain for Ontario soccer and helping the community better understand what we do, the role of the provincial body. There's interviews with staff, there's there to discuss what's going on and off the field. There's interviews with the membership and who, those who continue to push the game forward and unite us around that passion. We also speak to those who are occasionally not from soccer but are here to inspire us. And today's chat falls under that inspire portion, although he's very much in the heart of soccer. Stephen Caldwell. Stephen, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Ben. Pleasure you know, to be here. You know Stephen Caldwell from his play, work as a play-by-play -play analyst on TSN, commentary on the Summer's World Cup, former captain of Toronto FC, host of the Ontario Soccer Center yep. Circle Awards, and a member of our marketing committee as well. Stephen, great to have you. Uh, lots to get to, but let's start with this Summer's World Cup. Uh, I mean, for the average person, it's a, it's a month-long party. You're out on the pubs, you're out on the patios, <laughs> you're really enjoying yourself. Uh, but for people like yourself, uh, working behind the scenes and on camera, it's getting up every day at an enormous hour, 6 a.m., 4 a.m., yeah. 5 a.m., grinding for eight hours of television every day. And it's honestly, it was one of the best produced World Cups I've, I have in recent memory. Thank you. And uh, for, for, just tell us a little bit about sort of how the sausage is made in that respect and sort of what you went through in your day-to-day -day grind during that stretch. Well, first and foremost, that's one of the downsides of being on camera for every single match. You, you miss the, the, the special, you know, mix that you get in Toronto with finding that area. And, you know, I've been in the Danforth for a great game. Uh, I know they weren't there yeah. this year, but it's a special experience. And there's always that little pocket um, with that national pride and, and, and you get that exuberance. So that was, unfortunately, something that we didn't experience, but we got the absolute pleasure to bring, you know, a, a world-class tournament to the country of Canada. And I don't think that was lost on any of the three of us or any of the guests that, that we managed to have uh, come on the show. We were extremely privileged to be there and, and, and to be a part of that. We prepared for hundreds of hours leading into that World Cup. It, it took a tremendous preparation. Again, we were very mindful of the fact we were in a country and, and uh, we were, you know, from a city that is uh, has a little bit of different nations in that city and we had to do that, that team justice, that country justice, were preparations. So I don't think, you know, anybody was as thorough for uh, games as we were, I think, you know, heading into you know, a Korea game or a Sweden game or wh whoever it was, we were absolutely thorough. It wasn't just the big teams for us that we were yeah. focused on. Um, and once we got into it, it was just fantastic. When you're prepared for something, you feel great. It flowed along. We had great production. I appreciate you saying that. I do think that our guests were really good. Howard Webb was a fantastic addition to our team. Yeah. He's great on camera, he's a great guy, he's obviously a world class referee and now working for Pro. I thought that was a, a really amazing piece of work by our uh, production team to get him on the show and to explain VR, video review, yeah. something that was new for the World Cup. Um, Carl Robinson, Terry Dunfield, Janos Mihalik um, and, and us three guys for every single game and uh, grueling at times, sometimes very tiring where you would sort of forget where the conversation was going because you were so exhausted um, but I think all in all a tremendous privilege to be part of it and uh, we're very proud of the work that we did. Yeah I want to come back to that in a moment that grind that yeah. this is because I think that'll have real good relation to what our community goes through in most days but is there a moment for you during the World Cup the what that stood out I mean you watched almost every minute of every game I assume you every know. minute yeah, every <laughs> I did, I promise you it's crazy like, yeah. just to, to watch that much soccer in such a short period yeah. of time for us again it's like you're watching it and you're enjoying it but when you're on your end of things you're watching it you're analyzing it and you're looking at formation or what was the moment for you that sort of stood out from this tournament either it be a player that emerged or yeah. a moment that happened what was it for you that you took away and you'll sort of always remember oh it was such a good tournament and it was so easy to talk about every single game there was <laughs> one match it was Denmark France the, the last group game in group C that we struggled a little bit but we you know we got through it it was fine we had six minutes we, we there was nothing happening in that game it was a yeah. stalemate I think yeah. it ended zero zero but a pretty boring game both sides just kind of France pushed a little bit to be fair to them but Denmark wanted to draw and yeah. every other game had a story it had you know things to talk about Neymar's diving was a big issue Lopetegui losing his job before the tournament uh, Portugal, Spain, and the you know the second day, their, their first match in their group was an amazing football match with so many moments of quality, great goals, great pieces of play. Um, oh, 
team football was back uh, with with a bang. I really thought sure. there was such great organisation to to some of the smaller nations and the way that they prepared themselves to to compete. I thought was really brilliant to watch. Um, I think of like a Sweden who were were very sure about what their game plan was. They were set up to be a tough four four two, difficult to break, but. When they got the opportunity, they then move forward. They did it with pace. They did it with assurance. I, I really enjoyed watching them at times. Um, Croatia with their football, different styles and, and different ways of playing the game. Because at the end of the day, that that's why we love football because different styles match up against different styles, and somebody comes out on top. And this World Cup really threw together real different styles, different ways of playing the game and some shocks to some of the bigger nations. It was interesting to watch some of the more traditionalists, you'll call them, sort of expecting, you know, the Icelands of the world to get stomped and then getting frustrated yeah. that, that that style, which isn't necessarily appealing to the eye but can be very functional, was going and beating these teams yeah. and having that success. And it was So it was interesting to watch sort of that traditionalist mentality take hold that, oh, this has been the worst World Cup of all time. Meanwhile, the casual fans losing their brain because yeah. it's like what's going to happen next and I don't know just to, to take it back to that that grind for a moment um, everyone in this game is sort of running themselves ragged whether it's coaches admins players everybody here is doing it for the love of the game and soccer is such a demanding sport whether you're an athlete or whether you're on the sidelines uh, and one of you can just sort of take some of your wisdom from your time as a player or this summer covering the world yeah. Cup and what you do when you hit that wall and how you sort of re-inspire yourself to come back to the to come back to the table or come back to the game and, and keep on going yeah well they're the moments that you really find out about yourself and and, and how much determination you have to, to put on a good show, whether it be as a broadcaster or as a soccer player or as a coach or as a, an admin executive. I don't know. Every, there's many ways that you hit moments where it becomes tough, you get tired, you wonder if you're the right guy or you're capable of doing that job and, and that's when you find out how much determination you have inside you and I, I was lucky that I was fortunate enough to play the game for 18 years and go through the moments where I, you know, I'd ask myself, am I good enough for this level, am I good enough for this team and um, finding ways is, is, is the, the most special part of my playing career, finding ways to win, finding ways to compete and finding ways to get better um, and I, I sort of use that same mindset as I, as I go into my, you know, the early stages of my broadcasting career where you know, I, when I started, I was okay. Maybe I showed some promise and signs, but there was a lot of improvement that needed to be done. And instead of just sitting back and maybe hiding in the corner, you, you go, you ask your producers, how can I get better? You ask your, your, your bigger bosses, your colleagues who have been in the game, uh, in the broadcasting genre for, you know, 10, 15 years. I, I work with two of the best in the business and Luke Wildman and, and Christian Jack. They're phenomenal, the way that they prepare for their job, their, their quality, their the standards, the, the excellence that they produce on a you know a, a weekly basis, a daily basis is just phenomenal and I recognise that right away and I want to be their guys and I want to show that same work rate that they show every single day to learn and get better and you find yourself getting better and then hopefully you get to a position where again as a player or as a broadcaster or whatever genre you're in, you can give a little bit back to the, the next generation that are coming up through advice or, or, or through some help. I think that has real relatable threads to sort of our community as well, whether it's coaching yeah. and seeking out mentorship, whether it's refereeing and seeking a better understanding yeah. of, of the community. And for me, like I, I sort of listening to what you're saying there, it's it really is, it's an internal decision to sort of power through. So yeah. what, what would you say you say to yourself in those moments or what would you say to someone externally to sort of make them push a little bit further when they get stuck in those moments? Because I, I really feel like our club community and our academy community, they, they work so hard yeah. day in and day out and so it, it can be exhausting. What, yeah. what is it that sort of pushes you past that? that moment? Well, to, to put myself in their shoes, they have to realise that they're valued, you know, so um, you're feeling tired, you're maybe feeling a little bit like you're not... Run down. Yeah, you, you're not getting maybe the, the, the adulation or the respect that you deserve and, and you need to realise that you are valued, you are needed to be in that role to allow that under 12 girls team or under 8 boys team to, to prosper and develop and get better and it's a little bit like that for me where you know it was never lost on us that we are broadcasting a World Cup to a nation and there's a million people watching every single day, every single match almost 
uh, and we have a duty to teach the game to these people, to um, use our expertise, to allow the ones that are you know pretty knowledgeable about soccer to maybe learn a little bit of something new on that that given match, and and just to give honest and fair analysis. Is, that's the biggest thing for me. It's uh, you know coming from playing at TFC to now getting to broadcast Vancouver Whitecaps and TFC uh, in uh, Montreal Impact Canada national team. To me, it's it's really important that I'm fair. I'm fair to every single individual player. I'm fair to every single team, and I just say what I see, and I say it openly and honestly. And if I get it wrong, I admit it. That's another thing. It's accountability is really important to me in life. Um, and it was as a, a soccer player, I'd always hold my hands up and say it was my mistake, my fault today guys, um, how can I help, how can I get better? Again, always striving to, to, to get better and uh, I have the exact same mindset in anything that I do and uh, you know, I've obviously took that into my, my broadcasting career. I, I like that word you use, duty. I really feel like soccer is in some respects, if you care yeah. about the game, it's, it's your duty to continue doing the work that you're doing and whether it's broadcasting or coaching, as I said, it's sort of just coming back to that internal drive, like yeah. what pushes you to be more in this game or what pushes you to do things differently. And we'll come back to that in a second. I want to talk about some of the projects you're working yeah. on in the soccer community as well. But a lot of times when athletes retire, they sort of take a traditional route into coaching or other aspects of the game. And you've really sort of spread your wings. You've gone from the director of business development for a time at Toronto F or at MLSC, yeah. uh, TSN broadcaster. You're now mar on the marketing committee here at Ontario Soccer. And I know behind the scenes, you work on a lot more. Uh, when you retired as an athlete, what, what do you say to yourself in these terms? These are the things I want to accomplish in sort of my second act of my career. Yeah. Uh, great question because it really is the hardest thing in the world to retire as an athlete. It's yeah. such a privileged life and um, you have extreme focus for anybody to get to, to a professional level it takes focus and dedication and sacrifice and to know what your goals are and hopefully accomplish them or at, or at least get some of the way along. Obviously I wanted to play captain for Manchester United or Liverpool or one of the big teams that never happened. I didn't have the talent to get there, but I squeezed every inch out of uh, my career that I possibly could with the talent that I had. And I was very sure about what I wanted from an early age. And then all of a sudden that's gone. I'm, I'm no longer an athlete. I'm no longer a soccer player. I have to figure out what I want to do next. And it takes a long time. It's a, it's a tough transition. And I would like to see more done for ex-players. It's, it's something that I'm passionate about and I hope to maybe take up in the future. So, you know, I don't think we integrate these athletes into society as well as we should. I think that they all have um, phenomenal attributes that could be used in any walk of life. And, and um, I sort of think we just kind of leave them or assume they're fine. Maybe they'll get millions of dollars or you know, they've got a gorgeous family and there's all these things that we assume, cars, Ferraris, whatever, with, with athletes that yeah. makes them, you know, fine and at the pinnacle, but they, but they go through the same insecurities and mental issues and, and what am I going to do next as everybody else as you have a, a you know, severe career change. So it was the same for me. I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was fortunate that MLSE saw enough in me that they felt I had the skill set and, and, and the attributes that could be transitioned into another role and you know I went in there and, and I worked under Chris Schufel and Anton Wimmer and Tim Laiwicki was there at the start and, and Dave Hopkinson and they could go on and on with the names. A lot of people helped me throughout that transition and allowed me to figure out where my next steps would go and, and were also I have to say fantastic with me when it came to uh, allowing me to, to find where my strengths were, you know, with my broadcasting, on you go Steve, we know you're not going to be in the office for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Champions League afternoons, we're, we're fine with that, we're, we want you to, to develop in, in whatever area you, you want to go and I, I think that I'll always be grateful to MLSE for that, to give me that opportunity and, um, and, and to allow me to just um, to become or, or transition into my new role. I like, I like what you said, sort of the, the ability to do what you think you wanted to. And yeah. So that, that's fantastic from MLSC's perspective. And so I want to ask you, what is it you want to do? Yeah. yeah. So you're, you've been working on some things in the, the community, uh, youth focused and yeah. still in its infancy. So I won't put you on the spot too much, but just sort of tell us what your goals are there in trying to reach out to the soccer community as a broad and as a whole and uh, what, you're, what you're looking for there. Well. I want to see this game develop in Canada. I think we have a unique uh, opportunity and the time is now with the World Cup coming here in 2026. 
uh, to really take this game to the next level. I've saw enough movements, whether it be with television numbers or participation or excellence coming out of uh, the Greater Toronto area and indeed the entire country of Canada to make me think that this is it, this is where it's happening and this is it now and, and I want to be part of that but yeah. everybody wants to be part of something special and yeah. I'm exactly the same and I think something special is happening right now and I have a great passion for community I love being out there and meeting people and and and, and using the skills that I have as a, as a person or I had as a soccer player which to me you know I was always a captain I have leadership skills I have attributes that can make a difference to a kid or to a team or to uh, any organisation and I, I just want to, to figure that out. Uh, I think that we're on the right path but there's many ways that we can improve our elite pathways. Um, but I want to see the five lads that make it into that team for the 2026 World Cup or I know maybe the, the, the 19 Women's World Cup is probably coming a bit soon but the, the, the 2023 next Women's World Cup, you know, there's, there's, there's fantastic participation, boys and girls in this province and um, and we have a lot of talent and I just think there's some areas that we need to tweak a little bit to, to maximize that, that talent. So let, let's drill down into that and then I, I want to echo what you said. I, I feel like most people sort of sense that soccer's at a turning point here. Yeah. Right? It's, if we can get it right, it could be right for a really long time. We're eight years out from hosting yeah. the World Cup here in Canada. And uh, what does Captain Caldwell say to see for us? <laughs> and uh, paint me that picture of what Ontario and Canada looks uh -huh. like in 2026. The World Cup's about to happen. You're in the broadcast booth. People are on the patios. What does soccer look like here if, uh, if we do get things right in the lead up to that? Well, I think it, the sky's the limit. I do think that we have so much talent here. We, we obviously know how, how diverse an area and a country that we live in. And, I, I just can't see why the best players are not going to be from here if we give them the right platforms to go and succeed and, and improve. So I just see a, you know, a real vibrant community that, that has real talent. There's, there's many different pathways to succeed and, and to get there. And uh, I think we're again working on that with the Ontario Academy Soccer League, uh, that, that kind of stream beside the OPDL, I think that's also important. Academies have a big part to play in this development as well. It's important that you recognise what you are for me. You know, if you're a community club and you're all about participation and bringing kids in, and that's fabulous. That's absolutely fine. It doesn't mean that you need to have an elite stream to your club. You just need a connection to that elite stream. Let's all work together. Let's all get in a room and, and get the system right. You know, instead of, you know, as we know in the past, there's been a little bit of bickering over a few things and that, and we want that to be, to be gone. Uh, Facilities, we need more facilities. All the challenges that we have, there's not a lot of space in this area. It's difficult, it's expensive, but we need more pitches. We need more uh, open pitches for kids to go and play soccer after their dinner or in a, a less structured environment, and a safe environment, but less structured. Um, and that comes through government funding. And there's, everybody needs to come together here to, to give these kids a chance to get to this Eureka moment of World Cup 2026 and then everything's set up, the platform's there to then go and succeed and improve beyond that. We talk about it as it's the runway. Yeah. It's like if you wait until you get there, the plane's not going to take yeah. off. And so the work has already begun and the work has to be, the hard work has to be over this next eight years, yeah. whatever it is at this point. And for me, I, I sort of get chills thinking about what soccer could be in this province because in this country as well because for for so long it's sort of meandered its way through yeah. finally people have said let's professionalize the environments let's bring people together let's break down walls and you're sort of seeing it all come together now yeah. it's, it's hard for people sometimes to see through that fog of what had happened previously and for me uh, I'd like just to hear your take on it like how close are we to getting to that point um, I think we've still got a little bit to go, if I'm absolutely honest. Um, I think that we're producing more talented players. I mean, we just had the lad that signed for Bayern Munich um, out of Edmonton, who obviously is playing in Vancouver Whitecaps, Alfonso Davies, outstanding talent. Uh, I watched them live the end of March, and of course he showed potential from 14, 15 years old, and he was a very good player then. But I went to Canadian Championship uh, first leg a few weeks ago, called the game with, with Luke and the difference in that lad in four months, what's that, four or five months is just phenomenal. Right. 
he's 17 and a half, 17 three quarters. Um, so where can he get to? And that's it, just an example. There's, there's more of the lads that, and girls that are playing at, at different, uh, different provinces, different cities, different areas. And we've got to increase our recruitment system, our, our way of finding this talent and, and harnessing it, bringing it into the system, finding a place for it to play um, and an environment that anybody can play. I keep reiterating that. We need to find an environment where anybody can play. They'll find a the team, they'll find their level eventually, and they'll be allowed the, the, you know, the development through the coaching and the, the infrastructure to go and push on and get to the, the absolute level, pinnacle level that they can be at. Stephen, thank you. Thank you. Guess this was fun. Uh, you're a great ambassador for the game here Thanks, in Ontario. Thanks, Ben. Uh, fantastic from the broadcasting down to the grassroots. Uh, you're seeing athletes giving back like this. It's, it's been a pleasure talking to you today and working with you uh, as we do sort of run into each other in the halls around these times. Thanks, so, Ben. Stephen, thank you again. And uh, for Stephen, I'm Ben. And we, as always, we encourage you to play, inspire, and unite.